Okay, uh, so we'll get started here. Uh, welcome everyone to another um, Sunday valuation session. Um, so we, we have switched these to Sundays now. I think going forward, um, kind of after my move to San Diego, there's just a lot of stuff happening on Saturdays. So Sunday just works better. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of keep that going. Um, interesting times as we uh, kind of enter into the end of Q3. Uh, we had the OPEX expiry week here last week, lots of volatility. It just doesn't seem to end. It's getting more and more volatile. We have the Fed meeting coming up and things that the oil market really didn't care for until recently and getting affected quite a bit by that. Uh, the broad market's obviously not, not doing too well. Uh, I posted a chart there last week on year-to-date performance. And uh, despite kind of the, the beating we've taken in, in energy since June, uh, still an exceptional outperformance over the call it the tech sectors or the uh, consumer discretionaries and other other sectors of the market. Um, so definitely lots happening. Um, are there less participants in the market? Are there more? It's it's really hard to say. We're kind of at this time where it seems like people are pulling money out of the market. There's a lot of money seems to be on the sidelines, but at the same time. People are looking for those deals again now uh, because everything has sort of come down a bit. People are back from their summer vacations. Uh, I was looking at the number of people going to, to workplaces chart and we've had this massive spike in the last probably two or three weeks. So uh, people are coming back in the office and they're saying, okay, well, time to kind of put some money to work here. So uh, definitely lots going on from that standpoint, uh, WTI prices as well. Uh, just this morning slash last night, we had China announced that the uh, Chengdu lockdown is ending as of Monday, which it's basically Monday there uh, right now. And uh, we'll see how the market sort of reacts here when, when it opens, uh, when the futures open. And uh, we have the SPR sort of these, these massive releases that have been going on, uh, seven and a half and then eight, I think 8.4 last week. And commercial inventory is not really building that much. At the same time that China, Chinese inventories have gone down, you know, 30 to 50 million barrels in the last, call it four to six weeks. So there's definitely a resurgence of demand coming in from sort of across the world. And the price of WTI is sort of hanging in there, uh, looking into the future now to see what's going to happen past the... Uh, the Chinese elections, the U.S. midterms, the SPR ending, we see, you know, probably in about three weeks, the, the temperature in a lot of Russia drops below freezing. So, you know, now that some of these service companies are, are out of Russia, what's going to happen there? Uh, I mean, it's, it's not that hard to operate wells in the summertime, but when the temperatures get below freezing and you start having incidents, you have uh, gas pipelines freezing off, you have Oil, oil getting more waxier, uh, heavier oil, uh, harder for it to flow is, is when we really see the impact of what impact did the service companies leaving have and, and to what extent have they actually left. So lots of catalysts here on the market. Uh, obviously we have Q3 ending. Uh, we have some companies with hedges rolling off as well. And uh, you know then we'll look forward to kind of Q3 results in just over a month right now. So uh, definitely lower WTI average in Q3 than Q2, but either way, these companies are doing really well. They paid off a lot of debt. Their, their shareholder return policies are kind of coming to fruition other than the companies that are doing the acquiring, um, which have kind of moved it into the future a bit, uh, possibly higher returns, but, but definitely delayed. So a couple things up front. I'm not an investment advisor, so everything that I say today is my own opinion um, based on kind of what I've seen, my own experience in the past. Uh, please do your own due diligence. Uh, definitely important in this sector, especially there's a lot going on. It's, it's a huge sector, obviously, and the companies are maybe a little bit different than they were uh, in 2014. 
I've got pushback on that, but I can almost say for certain that these companies are not the same that they were in that era. Their mindset is different. Their debt ratios are different. Uh, their product production profiles are different. So there's a lot going on. And for us to just say that, oh, these are just the same old oil companies is, is not really doing yourself a service and just a sector a service uh, from an investment standpoint. Uh, please also check your own risk tolerance. Uh, very, very important. There are various kinds of companies in the sector, and I will kind of talk about that today where we'll discuss uh, a major oil sands player which has been very, very active on the share buyback front. And then we'll have the a couple of royalty companies, which I don't think I've covered any royalty companies so far. So it'll be a little bit different, a different way to play the sector. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss sort of my opinion on the royalty companies, um, but they are there. So I think I needed to discuss them at some point and, and share sort of where the risk reward is with them. Um, and then... Uh, please check your own risk or, or uh, portfolio construction as well. The way that I run my portfolio on my website, I've got a lot of questions on it recently. It's about a 50% margin, a margin portfolio. So I can't just have it filled with options and junior companies. And, you know, why, why aren't you in this XYZ high tour company? Because it's just the way the portfolio is constructed. Uh, I need to have that sort of that downside protection to some extent. And if I have to give up some of the upside torque in order to stay in margin, um, the way that I've run my models and my calculations, it, it puts me in a better spot, assuming the macro plays out how I feel it will be and how it's looking like it's going to uh, sooner or later. Uh, all, all that this SPR and recession talk and narratives are doing is pushing the can down the road, uh, kicking the can down the road and whatever's on the other side just seems to be getting not only more obvious, but also a, a higher range possibly that we end up in because you don't have these insurance policies anymore. Uh, your, your SPRs, your extra uh, drilled uncompleted wells count, your uh, floating storage, et cetera. So definitely lots going on there. Um, the Zoom is recorded. It will be posted on YouTube. It'll also be posted to my website uh, under archive seminars. Um, like I mentioned before, the hosting website that I use is having a little bit of changes they're making to their models, the way that the website works and some of the things are getting messed up. I got an email this morning that one of the YouTube links got changed. So I'm gonna go back and adjust that here uh, as well. The Twitter space is also recorded and I think Twitter's storing them for longer than 30 days now, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, it'll be there for 30 days uh, at a minimum anyways. Uh, the other thing is I do have a mailing list going on. So the files that I use to make these valuation spreadsheets, I send them out along with the Zoom link every, I try to send them a day or two before. I've not uh, stood up to that in the last couple of sessions, just gone delayed with getting the, the, the list out, uh, the files out, but Going forward, I, I'm going to try to get them at least 24 hours out before the session starts. So uh, people can download the files, go through the files. But if you want to be on the mailing list, just shoot me a DM or an email and uh, I'll get you on there. It is being run manually, the mailing list for now. So if you were getting them and you aren't getting them anymore, just shoot me a message again, please. And I'll, I'll get you on there. And um, the sessions until October 16th, I believe, have been scheduled. So uh, there's a lot of content coming up here in the next month or so. And I look forward to sharing them. This is, I think, just about the last companies that are left out of the 55 or 60 that I'm covering right now. So I think by the, by the mid, middle of October, I'll have covered almost all of them. So there'll be sessions that are recorded that cover almost all of them. And then we'll sort of get into the re, re going through some of the older ones as things have changed. They've made acquisitions, their debt profiles are changed, they've adjusted their drilling plans, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll just we'll just keep on keeping on. And uh, lots of other content coming as well here in terms of the data visualization part of things. I think uh, that's going to be the next sta stage here through Tableau. So for those who've seen MC Mike's uh, little dashboards. 
Um, I think they're fantastic and just going to build on them and, and just have more, uh, more dashboards, more visualizations that, that just make it easier for investors to see, okay, these are the companies, this is what they do, this is kind of where, where they are, uh, and so forth. Um, I think that's about it for, for the uh, pre-session messages, I guess, and uh, we'll get started. So uh, three companies today, like I mentioned, uh, Imperial Oil, one of the biggest oil sands companies out there, one that often gets ignored that's kind of the theme I'm running with here for the last session. And then this session, uh, companies that don't really get talked about very much, despite being very attractive investment candidates and having their own sort of compelling valuations. Uh, Imperial Oil being a basically a 100% oil sands uh, producer. And it's, I think it sort of gets ignored because 70% of the shares are held by ExxonMobil. So there's not that much free float out there. It's a very generic, basic company. Like there's, there's nothing really about them uh, that's difficult to understand, that's uh, all that unique. Uh, but in a 80, 90, 100, $110 oil price environment, they're just printing cash. They have about 500,000 barrels of refining capacity, uh, Canada's biggest refiner with domestic refining capacity, I should say. Um, a lot of refining capacity out east and then in the uh, Strathcona, Edmonton area as well. Um, you know, just, just really not much going on. It's a very, very simple company. It's, I like to think of it like a bigger MEG energy, but, but if MEG was also fully integrated with the downstream uh, refining side of things. So it's sort of a proxy to that if you like that sort of investment in in meg energy i think this is something that i've been looking at more and more the problem is that there's so little free float out there that you know it it does trade at a relative premium to maybe some of the other names out there but uh, we'll go through the valuation session if it's your first time joining us i'm not going to go through every box and sort of what i'm doing here uh, for the full explanation, please check out some of the earlier sessions, the recordings from June, July, May, uh, where I go through every single box. I explain my model way more in detail and sort of why I think that way. Uh, but for the sake of these sessions, now that we've, you know, this is probably what the 30th or 40th session, I think we want to keep things uh, fast and then move on to the more of the insight portion of it where I wanna talk about some of the unique characteristics, some of the nitty gritty deep dive stuff that I, that I sort of look at. So um, Imperial Oil, about 413,000 BOEs per day, 100% liquids. They, they do have some small gas production and all that, but I haven't even bothered to put it in here. It's just so heavily heavy oil focused. Um, they are growing at about a, four to five to seven percent clip every year but that comes from their existing sites so they have three sites uh syncrude coal lake and curl so basically three sites and they're just growing them a little bit every year do some deep bottlenecking operations getting their production runtime up getting their um operational efficiencies going. So no new projects is their existing projects. About 413,000 BOEs is what they produce in Q2. Um, that probably includes a little bit of downtime for turnarounds, but it's a number I'm gonna run with. Uh, about 600 million, 636 million shares outstanding. Trades at about $61 a share right now, uh, 40 billion market cap and um, very low debt, about $3 billion of debt. So. Compared to their peers in, in CNRL, Suncor, uh, these sorts of companies, the Imperial's debt is very, very low. They've already met their sort of low, low end of their debt target. So now they're more onto the cash return to shareholder phase, which is what we're looking for from all these companies, but maybe three, six, nine, 12 months down the road. Um, before I go further, I do wanna say anyone that joined late on the Twitter spaces, uh, well, if you do want to join for the Zoom visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca. 
scroll to the bottom under events. The Zoom link is on there and you can join in for the visuals portion. Uh, if not, the Twitter space will continue as is uh, audio only as well. Uh, pretty decent dividend uh, coming out of Imperial Oil. I don't think this number is updated. They, they did recently raise this dividend. Um, so uh, not, not something that I think I've updated so far, but it's not a big number in the calculation. Uh, we have our last quarter's adjusted funds flow and free cash flow. So, you know, pretty big numbers we're dealing with here. Two and a half billion dollars, uh, basically, of, of, of both adjusted funds flow and free cash flow in just one quarter. So roughly, um, you know, on pace for very, very high numbers. But keep in mind that WTI in Q2 did average 108. So probably kind of the high benchmark for now that we go off of. Um, it was actually a really good quarter for my modeling perspective because I was able to see when the WTI pricing does get to that 110 range, which companies can actually execute and take advantage of that and which companies can't. So based on doing, doing that sort of information or getting that sort of information, uh, the modeling was adjusted. So some of the Q2 price targets, you know, were, were came down and I got a couple of questions as to sort of what happened. And that's exactly what happened is in an 80 to $90 price environment, the companies were making a lot of money. Uh, based on that, we did some forecasting to what they would make in a hundred to 120 range. And some companies just did not execute. They had whatever issues happened with them, their costs skyrocketed, their royalties went up, their operating costs went up whatever the reason was, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the point was the modeling was adjusted for certain companies to bring them more in line with what they actually did. And the, the model is completely fluid and dynamic. So if in Q4, let's say WTI averages 110 again, and they are able to execute, well, the model will be adjusted again. So uh, I'm just not gonna give them credit for something that they've shown they can't do. Uh, until they actually do it. Um, so 108 strip pricing right now, about $81 a barrel. So that's the forward uh, curve for the next year. Um, you know, lower than it has been for quite a while. Uh, that being said, there's extreme pressure on WTI right now with, with the secondary Chinese lockdown. We had a, a bunch of Russian barrels stay on the market. We've got uh, Joe Biden, the newly minted gasoline analyst. Um, we have the uh, recession risk and the European kind of crisis, a lot of narratives around that. At the end of the day, oil inventories have not built. Despite all this, oil inventories have not built. And we're going into sort of these upcoming impending catalysts for oil demand going up um, as, as sort of things go on here. Uh, month by month. So the exchange rate, definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, this was about $1.25 earlier in the year. Now it's $1.33. So it definitely makes an impact to Canadian producers and their cash flows, the pricing they're receiving for WTI. So, you know, if, if, if the WTI strip is at $81 US, um, you know, that's about 115 plus Canadian. Um, or no, 105, about 105 Canadian uh, or higher. So definitely an impact compared to 2010 to 14, um, and definitely an impact compared to even three months ago or six months ago, uh, another five to 7% bonus uh, that these producers are getting. Uh, gas pricing, very, very volatile, but Imperial doesn't produce any gas, so I'm gonna leave it be. Um, and that's that. So that's the model. At strip pricing, we get roughly an 11% free cash flow yield and a fair share price that's $53 a share. So actually below where we are right now. So again, when I say this company trades at a premium, I mean, it, the, the proof is right there. Um, based on the modeling, we, we are trading uh, at a premium with Imperial Oil, whether that's a dividend, the share buyback or Exxon's big uh, stake, maybe a combination of all three. But either way, it definitely trades at a premium. However, if we look at, let's say, a $90 strip, uh, a $90 oil price in the future, 
we get a $75 a fair share price. So call it a 25% upside from here. You know, nothing too crazy, but the, the, the real thing that makes Imperial so attractive is the upside torque in this company. So as soon as we get to $100 uh, pricing environment, the fair share price gets to $100.52. So uh, call it about a 70% upside from here. And if we want to look at a $120 oil price environment, which I'm not going to say is, is going to be imminent, but it's looking more and more likely as sort of we see OPEC unable to add barrels, we see shale unable to add barrels, we see inventories draining, and demand doesn't seem to be going down. So if you believe in this, as uh, Eric says, the, the dare to dream scenario, the fair share price becomes about $151. So you get about 150% upside from current prices. And keep in mind, this is a $40 billion company. You know, this is a, a, a blue chip with low debt. Uh, Exxon owns 70% of it. It's not, it's not going to go gyrate up and down uh, crazily because there's not that much free float out there. There's not that many weak hands in this name to begin with. They've got a pretty decent dividend that holds the fort for now. Um, so, you know, to see, to see fair share prices with 150% upside in blue chips is stuff that we've never seen before. And maybe a year ago, you could say, well, we still don't know the oil macro, what's happening, what's going on. Well, it's becoming clearer by the day. So it's, it's pretty embarrassing that these companies are still trading at a call it two to three times cash flow, um, you know, trading at possibly, if we look in the future, trading at 20, 25% free cash flow yields. It's, uh, you know, you, one has to think that there's some significant substantial issuer bids coming, or there's some takeover candidates here where companies are just minting so much cash. They just say, well, hang on a sec. Why don't I just go and buy these, buy this production? I'll shut down all my rigs and just buy this production and rake in the free cash flow for years to come. So I'm getting more and more worried in a way that some of these companies are going to get bought out at like prices that investors don't really want to sell these companies at. Um, but we'll see. With Imperial, it's not really a concern because Exxon owns 70% of the shares. So they're not going to let it go for you know, peanuts if there's some, some deal comes in. In fact, Exxon might be the one that just takes the whole thing over um, you know, in, in the near future, possibly. Uh, so that's that. There's no real hedging going on. It's a internally hedged company because they have the production and they have their finding capacity to match. Uh, so great, great to be in that environment uh, right now because there's some sort of questioning as to is the WTI price going to go up or is the crack spread going to go up? And with companies like this, it doesn't really matter because effectively what you're making is the oil price plus the crack spread on every barrel anyways. Uh, so potentially a way to kind of like self hedge yourself if, uh, if you think they're finding issue is going to get worse and there's some refineries that are, that are possibly going to go down. Uh, these sorts of companies are actually really good hedges without having to buy like buy USO puts and all this complicated strategies that uh, people were, were recommending to me that just did not make sense uh, at the end of it all. Uh, so there's no hedging. I haven't put any production growth in there right now. I'm just going to kind of use a wait and see method with this company. So given that there's no hedging, no production growth into the model, our, our, um, our secondary final uh, fair share prices end up at the same level. So at strip pricing, $53 at $100 price, uh, at $100 WTI, about $100 per share. And at 120 WTI, about $151 per share is, is what the model spits out. Um, yeah, that's at strip gas, I should say. Um, because the company doesn't produce any, any gas, I mean, these two should be same. I'm not sure why they're different here. So uh, I will have to check, check my model here. Um, but either way, those are sort of the rough ranges that we're in. Um, in fact, 
I know what the issue is here. So the with Imperial, I did make some adjustments to the model based on exactly what I said earlier, because uh, they either executed or they didn't execute. Um, so so the, the actual final prices, which are on the price target spreadsheet, at strip pricing, 68.70 uh, per share, at $100 oil, 104.29, and at $120 oil, we have 141.98. So again, roughly 140% upside from, from current uh, share prices in $120 oil price environment. So uh, absolutely amazing. And if we wanna go down to about the $70 oil price environment, uh, it's worth 47.76 a share, about a 20% downside in a $70 oil price environment. So um, if Imperial didn't trade at a premium to its peers, I think you would definitely see this in my portfolio uh, in the place of kind of the top two stalwarts that I have in there, um, holding their, uh, holding my fort in my portfolio. I mean, I would not hesitate to have something like this in there. I get the upside on the refining margins, um, but it just trades at such a premium because people realize the same thing that I do and they've sort of either front ran me or they've not let the stock price drop to the levels um, where it becomes a relatively attractive uh, to its peers. A pretty low capital program. So for a company like Imperial with, with 400,000 uh, BOEs slash barrels of production, their capital program is only $1.2 billion. So if you wanna compare this to something like a CNRL, something like a Synovus, um, something like a Suncor, you'll find that their capital program is, is actually quite lean. Uh, I know those are bigger companies. They have, they have more assets, they have gas stuff, they have conventional stuff, yes, but it doesn't really matter. The, the point is they're able to maintain X barrels per day for less dollars per barrel. Um, capital program. And if the capital is lower, that's more money in your pockets. Um, so there's a couple of questions here. Imperial sold their XTO Canada, and that's why there's a difference in that gas. Yes. Yeah, you're right. I, however, took the XTO thing completely out before I even ran Q2 numbers. Uh, so this is just a difference in modeling because I adjusted my price target spreadsheet for those adjustments I mentioned earlier, but the this box and this box, I haven't adjusted the formulas yet because these boxes don't go anywhere. They, they don't link to anything. It's only these final boxes um, that end up linking to the price target spreadsheet. So just having that time to kind of redo the whole spreadsheet um, is would be the simple answer, but, but you're right. Um, Imperial did have gas assets with the XTO stuff, which I'll talk about here uh, shortly. Um, I also added in about 150 million of extra free cash flow sources. And the reason I put that in is because A, they're paying down debt. So they would save on the interest on that debt. And B, as you buy back your shares, you don't have to pay dividends on those shares. So if you buy 2 billion worth of shares and you're paying a 5% dividend, you're saving $100 million of dividend by buying back those shares. So I put that number in there as well. Something that often gets ignored uh, in the calculations, but when these companies start doing like seven, eight, 10, 15% buybacks, it does become something that we need to take into account um, kind of going into the future. Um, so there's a question here on the substantial issue bid. So I'll talk about that here in a sec. Uh, the curl production level, I don't have it off the top of my head, but their Q2 interim report does, does uh, give you the latest on it. Um, and yeah, we'll see what their cash return to shareholder policy is. We don't really have any clarity into the future as to what they're doing with this money. Um, and then the royalties, definitely something to watch. I will, say it uh, right now, I haven't really tracked their post payout, pre payout royalty thing, um, but the Alberta government posts that every year. So it wouldn't take long for me to go and, and, and check into that. And probably something that I will do here right away after the, the session here. Um, so yeah, pretty straightforward company. Uh, their capital is, is lean, as I said, 
they're getting a lot of free cash flow from the buybacks and they're paid out of the debt. So additional few dollars in the bank. And um, uh, so that's that. So that's a valuation model. We'll get to sort of the insight portion here. So one of the only companies that's actually done a substantial issuer bid so far, along with IPCO, uh, this is kind of one that that's had a big chunk that they've taken out. They bought back 5% of their shares outstanding at $77 a share. So you could say, okay, it was a mistake. They bought right at the high uh, at $77 a share. You could also say the company is so confident that buying back these shares is a good use of their cash that they don't really care. They say, ah, it's $60 or $77. It's, we, we still think it's undervalued. We think the stock is worth multiples of this uh, a share price. So we don't, we don't really care uh, what we're buying these, these shares back at. So a two and a half billion, a two and a half billion dollar SIB. Um, okay. What's the question here? Uh, yeah, it could be like if they do a special dividend, that, that could be a way to get money to Exxon. But I don't think the company is being run as like a feeding Exxon money. Like Exxon is making more than enough money on their own uh, that a dividend is not going to change uh, that. But a uh, good point. Um, so, so anyway, they bought 32 million shares. Uh, Exxon, obviously, 70% of that was Exxon because they wanted to maintain their, their proportional uh, ownership percentage. And this went through pretty quickly. They had more shares given up than they wanted to buy. So um, obviously, if the share price is $60 and you could sell your shares to Imperial at $77, you're always going to say yes to that and then go and rebuy them on the market. Uh, so uh, definitely quite interesting. Um, they also have their NCIB going, the uh, normal course issuer bid with the consistent buybacks as things go on. Uh, however, I think Imperial really likes these SIBs, so they might do another one. I believe you're allowed to buy 10% of the float every year with the SIBs, so maybe another 5% here coming up. And uh, they've also reduced their, their lines of credits, so they're so confident they don't need the money from the banks that they just said, you know what, we'll just reduce these lines of credits and I bet you within the next six months, these will be pretty much gone entirely because they just don't need them. They're in such a good balance sheet, uh, balance sheet shape that we don't need these anymore. And there was a really interesting chart that was put, uh, posted on Twitter that showed the bank line draws with banks uh, of oil and gas companies and it was just going up, 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 and then bang, just like fell off a cliff in the last 12 months because um, companies are paying back debt and they wanna pay back the bank debt uh, to begin with. And then they just say, ah, we don't want you anymore, like buzz off. And you didn't support us when we needed you the most. So we're not gonna pay your interest in a higher interest rate environment. We will just pay back this debt and move on. And when I say the, these companies have changed since 2014, uh, since 2010 to 14, in terms of their mindset, I think that's a big, big change because you talk to any executive in 2014 and if you're a bank and you offer them $100 million, they wouldn't even think about it. They would say, yeah, give me, give me every dollar you can give me. I don't care what the interest rate is. I just want more money. I want to empire build. I want to get bigger. I want to drill more it's a complete opposite now. Now they're paying back debt and they're saying, we don't want any more. Don't even bother us with deals to, to take on debt. So big, big, big change in where things are going. And one of the big supporters of the oil and gas structural bullish outlook is that companies just aren't investing in supply. Even in an 85, 90, $100 oil price environment, they just are not investing in supply. They, they don't care. You can't convince them to, to invest in new supply. And it's not because they want to price gouge or they want to you know, rake in money or anything. It's They've just suffered for too, too long. 
they're going to pay back the debts now. They're going to buy back the shares. They're going to reward shareholders. And then they could think of some sort of material uh, production growth. Uh, so once again, Imperial tendered 23 million shares almost, and they still hold about 70% of the shares. So 443 million uh, shares that they still hold worth what, $25 billion. So pretty, pretty hefty investment they have and, and they're keeping, they haven't, they're not dumping shares. They're not raising capital. They're not selling blocks. Nothing like that is happening. Um, Imperial also got about a billion dollars from the XTO sale which just closed on September 1st. So it's not reflected in this, this model as of the end of Q2, June 30th, but there's an extra billion dollars of value that the company just got. Um, you know, they could use that to buy back, uh, what would it be like 2%, 2% of the float just with that money. Uh, so uh, definitely great. And uh, Kyle makes an excellent point here. So the 69.6% ownership must be maintained at all times from the old Texaco deal. And it's not a risk of being trimmed. There you go. That's basically the certainty uh, you needed to, uh, to have in their, in their holding here. And any talk of any blocks leaving or pressure on the stock, it just can't happen. Uh, unless they dispose of the whole thing. So that would be a $25 billion disposal and nobody right now can afford to uh, buy anything like that um, at this time. And they probably wouldn't sell it at 60 bucks a share anyway. So moot point. A um, Couple other things here. So there's this oil sands alliance that was formed uh, recently between the six biggest oil sands producers they want to re reduce their GHG emissions by, I don't even know what the number is, 30% maybe by 2030 and get to net zero by 2050, uh, some sort of thing like that. And what they're doing is they're, they're pulling CO2 from their facilities in Fort McMurray. They're pipelining it down to Edmonton, uh, east of Edmonton, uh, the Coal Lake area and they have a carbon storage hub in that area where they then inject the CO2 into below sort of where they've been producing oil from. So the basal uh, Cambrian reservoir, they inject CO2 there and it gets stored theoretically in perpetuity, uh, therefore not in the environment. It's just something they're doing. One thing I would watch on this is the cost. So if the capital costs for these things start adding up, we will definitely have to adjust our models accordingly. Um, this is not really, really an option. They have to do this because if not, they will be paying the carbon tax on each ton of carbon emitted, which right now is 50 or $60 a ton, but by 2030 is gonna be $170 a ton. So either way, there's an impact here and watch for the capital cost for these pipelines, for the on-site facilities and the injection wells, because we're talking like three, four million barrels a day of, of oil sands production. Um, yeah, maybe not that much, but, but three million barrels a day of oil sands production that has to do this and go through this cycle. Uh, so definitely want to watch. Uh, production, as I mentioned, they're growing three, five, seven percent a year. They want to get to about 450,000 by 2026. So, um, you know, the, the Coal Lake, older field, staying flat, Sink Crude, older fields, basically staying flat. And then the, the curl is, is kind of the real growth driver uh, based on deep bottlenecking, operational efficiencies, little growth pads and uh, just better runtime, uh, less turnaround time, better runtime. So we'll kind of follow this as we go along. Some of the oil sands producers are beating their production estimates recently. And you, know, you almost have to wonder how much, how much extra juice is there to squeeze here? Like some of these oil sands producers, when oil was 60, $70 a barrel, 
might have not been worried about operational efficiencies. They might have said, you know what, we're not really getting that much benefit to running flat out at 100% efficiency. So, you know, just leave it, let it run as is. We don't want any major incidents. So just let it run at a lower state. But in an 85, 90, 100 dollar oil price environment, these efficiencies make a lot more sense. So is there five, seven percent on top left just by these oil sands, mines, and 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 SEG projects running at better efficiencies? Possibly. We'll uh, we'll find out here as we go. Um, a lot of cool things that Imperial is doing on site. So they're doing mine planning sort of beforehand instead of running things on time, like just in time, they're running a lot of reservoir simulation models, uh, mine optimization models. And they're saying it's about a 10 to 15,000 barrel a day increase in production just by doing this. So, you know, pretty substantial numbers when you, when you really think about it. Uh, 15,000 barrels a day at $80, $70 net back, a Canadian dollar, I should say. That's that's big, big money that the market just is not factoring in, or maybe maybe they are, and that's why this trades at a premium. But um, definitely lots of cool things happening here. They have a well downtime tracker that's adding 1,000 barrels a day. So small production, but it all adds up over a 20, 30, 40-year mine life or SAG deep project life. Um, that's that's pretty significant production. Um, failure analysis. This is something that's getting really, really big all across the oil and gas industry. They want to run these, uh, they use these laser cameras and detectors and they're able to figure out if there's any corrosion cracking, if there's any uh, heat spots, if there's any areas that are more subject to H2S and failure mitigation. And the reason for this is it's way easier to shut something down for a week and fix it than to have it blow up or have some sort of problem. And then you don't have the parts or you don't have the labor or you can't find the right grade of steel to put in the plant. So they're saying $40 million a year. I think it's going to get bigger and bigger impact uh, by, by doing these sorts of failure analysis and pre-failure surveillance. It's just a better way to run things proactively rather than reactively, especially in the oil field, because every hour, every minute of downtime is like in the thousands of dollars that you're losing. So big, big, big money involved in uh, this sort of analysis. Uh, they also have maintenance plan optimization. So this is kind of for, for better turnaround scheduling. Uh, some of us have been complaining about these nonstop maintenance activities, uh, turnarounds, the gas compression went down, you know, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of it has to do is because some of this equipment was just not maintained in a lower oil price environment and then during COVID, it just, it just was not maintained properly. They just didn't have the money or they just didn't care enough. But in a higher price environment, we should see better runtime. We should see better maintenance being, being taken care of. Uh, we also see maintenance on the, on the actual haul trucks, uh, $15 million a year savings. And the point I'm trying to make is when prices are low, these projects just don't get the green light to go ahead because it's just so hard to get dollars approved, to get optimization projects approved. Nobody wants to spend any money on anything. And now that these companies have money, a lot of these projects, which, which should have been done earlier, are now getting done and making significant impact kind of forever. So it's a it's something you're getting the benefit of, not just now, but into the future going forward. So if this like 40 plus 50 plus 10, uh, 15 million, that's a hundred million dollars. If we put even a six, six multiple on it, six times free cash flow, because this is all free cash flow, a hundred million per year extra, 600 million um, dollars is kind of the six times free cash flow model. 
uh, we're not even running eight, we'll run six. That's a dollar per share right there. And that's in perpetuity every single year going forward. Um, so all these things do add up. And then I'm not sure what this is. It's a colic water balance. So a thousand barrels a day additional. I like that they're doing all this stuff. It's just, it's just great to see a company really focusing on maximizing value for the shareholder. On top of this, they're using advanced wear materials on their mine, mine trucks and their diggers. So, you know, again, when oil prices were $60 and you went to your boss at Imperial and you said, hey, I wanna buy like a, a higher quality materials for our, for our mine trucks, you would've got laughed out of the building. You said, well, we don't have this money. Like where, where, do, you want, where do you want me to invent this money from? So now that they have the money, they put in better, uh, more reliable, lower maintenance uh, wear materials, and they're producing 4,000 barrels a day extra just from that. So, you know, very, very cool stuff we're seeing. Um, a lot of new technologies being trialed, being actually implemented in the field. Uh, they got some bitumen recoveries, uh, tailing bitumen recoveries. Uh, again, running field pilots, and if the pilots are successful, they go out and they make them sort of a full-time full -time thing across the company. Um, lowers greenhouse gas intensity. I'm not sure that really means anything, but uh, I like the production uplift, 11,000 barrels extra from these uh, tailing recoveries, um, which is awesome. Uh, this one is sort of a bittersweet one. So what they've done is they've automated their mine trucks. So they used to be run by people. Now they're run by computers. And they're saying it's about saving US dollar one per barrel in their operating cost. And they're gonna be the fully autonomous operator by 2023. So kind of by next year. Um, the reason I say it's bittersweet is because this unfortunately is going to lower a lot of people entering the industry. Um, when I was doing my engineering at the UFA, um, a lot of the, the, the mining engineering students and even some petroleum engineering students used to go to these sites and operate these, these haul trucks uh, for a summer or two. And it was great money. They could make seven, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month um, so, so they got a lot of money towards their tuition. They learned a lot about on-site operations. They sort of worked with the exact operators, with the engineers, with the, the field staff on site. They got to see the things as they are, not as they are on a computer or a spreadsheet. And, you know, the fact that these trucks are being automated, um, again, it's bittersweet because these students no longer have these opportunities to go and sort of be right on site, you know, running equipment on site, feeling like they're doing something and, and in, in actuality, like contributing to an active mine operation. Uh, so um, when, when I joined my program in 2013, they, they sort of said this was coming in the future and um, here it is, I guess. Uh, so great uh, from an investment standpoint, but as somebody who really, as I wanna be a big proponent of, of younger, the, the younger generation entering the oil and gas industry. Um, you know, this is a big negative, I think. Uh, these were really, really good jobs, uh, good experience for, for entrants, uh, younger entrants into, these, into the sector. Um, but at the end of the day, the job of a company is to make money and that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, so I can't really fault them uh, for doing that. It's about a $200 million a year savings um, by, by running these autonomously. Um, okay, uh, one thing, another thing I want to talk about is the gasoline and diesel crack spreads. So there's been a lot of talk about crack spreads and how they're blown out, their refiners are making a lot of money. And one thing that people don't know is that the Canadian refineries, as in the refineries, refineries that are in Canada, 
make a lot more money than their American counterparts. And in fact, their global counterparts. Um, because we have so little refining capacity in, in Canada and so much access to oil and bitumen and crude, um, it's just better margins for, this, for these refiners. So when we look at the average US gasoline crack and then the average Canadian gasoline crack, the Canadians get roughly a seven, seven to $10 call it bonus uh, on top of the US gasoline cracks. And the reason why this is so important is because let's say it costs roughly $15 a barrel to run a refinery, roughly. The US gasoline crack spread has been kind of between this 10 to $20 range for the last 10 years. So they're making somewhere between negative five to positive $5 a barrel. You see this when you look at a company like Synovus. Sometimes they're losing money on US manufacturing, which is their refining. Sometimes they're making money on US manufacturing. But the Canadian companies, they get a five to seven to $10 bonus on that. So they're making between call it 17 to $27 a barrel uh, gasoline crack. So A, they're always making money. And B, instead of the upside being $5 a barrel, the upside is now $12 a barrel. So more than two times uh, per barrel what the American refiners are making. It's a, it's a big, big difference. Like Canadian refineries always make money. American refineries sometimes lose money. And I know we're in a different regime going forward, but we are going to end up in a state where we have a lot of refining capacity as well in the future. Um, as some of these Kuwaiti refineries come on, Nigerian refineries, Malaysian refineries, um, maybe some of the Russian and Chinese refineries ramp up, um, you know, we could be back in a, in a state where we have more refining capacity than we need. And uh, we could again go back to a state where American, American refineries are losing money and Canadian refineries are making money. So very interesting uh, dynamic here for sure. And then when we look at the diesel crack, it gets even bigger. So Canadian diesel cracks are roughly, call it 10 to $12, $12 a barrel above what the uh, American refineries are set up to do. So why is that important? Because a lot of the oil that comes out of Syncrude, Curl, Coal Lake, um, some of the SAG-D projects is a very heavy diesel content um, barrel. So it's not really a three to one, uh, a three to one barrel, it's a two one one barrel where two barrels of this oil make one gasoline, one diesel. Um, and if the diesel crack is really high and you are the biggest domestic refiner in Canada, you're making a lot of money on refining um, in the normal times, let alone when you have elevated crack spreads. So here's the same thing in number form. So I'd mentioned earlier that a lot of Imperial's refining capacity is in the East Coast in Sarnia uh, slash Toronto area, Montreal area. And so let's look at the numbers. For the week of September 2nd, 2022, and keep in mind, diesel cracks are already very elevated these days. East Coast diesel crack is roughly $60 a barrel. Gulf Coast, which is your Houston area, is roughly $60 a barrel. Your Western Europe diesel crack is $47 a barrel. And your Montreal diesel crack is $88 a barrel. So it just goes to show you that 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 $12 bonus, that 10 to $12 bonus on diesel crack that was earlier, it wasn't really a 10 to $12 crack. It was a 30 or 40%. It was a percentage bonus, not a dollar bonus. And we see that now. East Coast at $60, Montreal's at $88. So roughly 50% higher is what they're getting. Um, and when we look at this in, in history, uh, so let's look at third quarter of 2022 so far. The Montreal diesel crack is at 80, 
East Coast diesel and Gulf Coast are roughly $50. If we go to third quarter of 2021, East Coast and Gulf Coast were at $15 to $16 a barrel. Montreal is at $30 a barrel. When we look at 2020, which was probably one of the worst times for refining oil, um, East Coast diesel and Gulf Coast diesel were at $7 to $8 a barrel. Montreal diesel was at $26 a barrel, still making boatloads of cash. Um, so if you're looking at refineries, you want to self-hedge yourself in, in, a, in a blowout of spreads, et cetera. This is a company that's actually quite, quite interesting. Um, from a integrated producer standpoint, when you compare it to its peers in Synovus and maybe Suncor, you know, there's, there's a, you can really make a clear argument that Imperial Oil is possibly the integrated producer to pick um, from an investment thesis standpoint. And again, none of this is, is investment advice. This is just the raw data and sort of my opinion around that. But I was actually quite surprised to see that in 2020, when almost every single refiner was losing money um, on, the, on the diesel crack, the Montreal and Toronto and possibly the Edmonton refineries were still making lots of money. Uh, so quite cool. And uh, yeah, so there's a comment here that high dislike prices help Imperial refineries and their Syncrude trades at a premium to WTI. Yeah, yeah, that's the other interesting thing in all this because the Syncrude blend makes a lot of diesel uh, and, and diesel is trading at such a premium to gasoline that the Syncrude barrel is, is a, a very heavily uh, premium barrel right now. Um, by the way, Suncor also sells Syncrude blend oil. Uh, so it's not just Imperial that's benefiting from that uh, Syncrude blend. Um, okay, a couple more things. Uh, dividend per share, constantly rising. They never cut their dividend. It's looking really strong right now. They, they haven't really been a dividend payer uh, the same way that CNRL and Suncor have, but they are seem to be getting into it more and more. Uh, we look at the common shares outstanding. They've brought it down from about 850 million to 630 in five years. And pretty strong share buyback, even in the 2016 to 2020 uh, times. And now that I really think about it, I think it's because of their refining and the high profit barrels that they're able to do this uh, when other companies really haven't to this extent anyways. Um, and free cash flow profile. So there's this upside torque on free cash flow that I mentioned earlier that the model spit out. And if I'm to kind of check my model, okay, at $80 US WTI, Imperial is saying, they're going to free cash flow roughly 5. 5.6, 5.7 million or a billion at $80 WTI. If I go back to what my model spit out right there, so at strip pricing, which is just above 81 WTI, the model says 5.86 billion. So very, very close um, modeling that's coming out of this, which is fantastic. It, it, it sort of gives my model credibility, but also I've been able to adjust my model to kind of fit this, um, whatever the share, whatever the companies are putting out, but in a different way to sort of get to that same number in a different way and verify it um, and get the model more, uh, more accurate across the WTI regimes from 70 to 120. And a couple final things here. So these are all of Imperial Oil's wells um, that they own. These are all the wells that are active. So they have a ton of abandoned wells all over the place. And that sort of comes back to Imperial's history. Uh, they're the ones that discovered the Leduc Woodbend area uh, 1947 started the great Albertan sort of oil boom. And they sort of had fields everywhere from 
Alberta to BC, Saskatchewan, uh, Northwest Territories, all over the place. And it was a very, very messy company. Uh, and again, I don't know the history that well. I don't spend that much time on reading company histories, uh, but this is what they are now. And this Edmonton area wells, these aren't even wells. These are like wells that are associated with their refineries. So sometimes refineries will have like a water production well or a water disposal well. And then they have these wells with their other refineries. And they basically have three things. They got Syncrude, they got Curl, and they got Coal Lake. And that's it. That's, that's how simple this company is. So when I said this is a very similar company to Meg, in terms of how to understand it, I, I really mean it. I mean, Meg Energy's got one thing, one asset, and they produce it. Imperial's got three assets, and they've got refineries. That's it. There's no other stuff all over the place, uh, gas production, nothing. Um, and they've abandoned every single one of these wells. They don't have any suspended wells at all, which is really amazing. Like they've abandoned over 10,000 wells um, in 60 years, 60, 70 years. And they don't just keep wells suspended status. They, they do their job, they get them abandoned, they reclaim the land and they move on. So, you know, people, people saying the Canadian oil patch is a polluter and they, uh, you know, they don't take care of their land. They leave their mess. It's not true with this company. Uh, they've, they've really done a really good job at abandoning the wells and, and sort of bring them, bringing them back to how they were uh, earlier. And therefore, there's very little abandonment liability other than their, obviously their operating assets, which are 20, 30, 40 year assets. If you discount ARO at even 2% for 40 years, it's basically a zero, zero number. Um, and a bit of sort of a cool, unique thing that's happened in the last year is Aspen Leaf Energy, which is backed by Arc Financial, has gone in back to the Leduc Woodbend area um, 75 years later and drilled like three or four absolutely monster wells. Uh, these are, I would, I would probably say these are the best conventional wells that have been drilled in the last few years. And I'm ignoring Clearwater, obviously, because it's a multilateral zone. It's, it's different. That's not conventional in a way. And I'm ignoring the oil sands uh, wells, some of which are, are very, very prolific on their own. Um, I'm talking strictly single leg horizontal conventional wells. This well has flowed at just about a thousand barrels a day since December of 2021. And a very, very cheap well. It didn't, it didn't cost very much, uh, but they've, they've probably hit some sort of reef in this Leduc wood bend that was missed by, by call it Texaco. Uh, I believe Chevron was in there too, uh, Imperial and them. And um, making boatloads of cash off it. So it's produced 278,000 barrels in nine months, call it. And if we run some cash flow numbers on it, it's probably made more than $20 million, one well. And I don't know what exactly cost, maybe 3 million, maybe five, somewhere in there, maybe less. Uh, so, you know, it's just a cool little historic, um, historic connection. And the reason I bring it up is because there are reef pools left. There are areas left that have not been tapped, but you need extensive 3D seismic, you need extensive coring and logging technologies. You need some of the best directional drilling, uh, state-of-the-art directional drilling. And I think as this bull cycle sort of continues, you might see companies start to take risks. They might say, you know what? If this well is a 40% chance of success, it's a 25% chance of success, but it's gonna make me $20 million in nine months. You know what, let's, yeah, let's, let's take a risk. Let's take a stab at it. Let's see what happens. Which from 2014 to 2020, you would pretty much get fired for saying or like suggesting 
any sort of exploration, conventional drilling uh, uh, of wells of this of this sort. So, you know, not only am I very pumped for this industry from a investment standpoint, but also from a geologic sort of exploration standpoint. There's some there's some cool fields left, uh, cool little zones left. Are they gonna come on at like? change the entire supply demand outlook of the world? No. Are they gonna add significant barrels to Canadian production? Probably not. But to a company that's making 3000 barrels a day and can drill three or four such wells, the, the upside is just absolutely tremendous. And um, you know, we'll get some cool little geologic case studies come out of it, uh, which are always uh, fun to see. Um, okay, so that's Imperial. Uh, if there's any questions on Imperial, uh, you put them in the chat. Um, and I just want to remind anyone on Twitter that if you do want to join for the visuals on Zoom, uh, please go to whitetundra.ca. The website is also in my Twitter profile. Scroll to the bottom under events and um, the Zoom link is in there. And you can join us for the rest of the, the visuals here um, for the two royalty companies. Um, okay, so no questions. So we'll move on to a couple of royalty companies here. Uh, so the first one I'll talk about is Topaz. Uh, Topaz Energy created out of tourmaline uh, in, when did they IPO? They IPO in late 2020, I wanna say, probably like June, July, August, September of 2020, somewhere in there. And it was created to get better monetization, better value for the midstream and royalty assets. Uh, so Tourmaline, very, very forward thinking company. Uh, Mike Rose, obviously under his leadership. And they, they came out with this, with this new model. Um, you know, they kind of ran it to see, okay, what's gonna happen, we'll see. And I think, <laughs> excuse me, when, when Topaz initially was formed, I think 70 to 80% was owned by Tourmaline still. They have sold a little bit of their, of their ownership uh, over the last couple of years, but still heavily held um, by Tourmaline. I wanna say they own 40 million shares, something like that. Um, And, you know, kind of a new model. We haven't had this sort of model for a long, long time. And they've been exceptionally successful in what they've done. They've had a lot of acquisitions come out. Um, they've, they've made a lot of acquisitions in the last couple of years. They've grown this company uh, from, from just tourmaline royalty uh, acreage to sort of other companies, royalty acreages as well. And, the reason I want to talk about royalties kind of right now is because they are getting more interesting to certain investors. Uh, there are investors who are worried about inflation. They're worried about capital cost of drilling wells going up uh, a lot, not just a little, but a lot. Uh, they want exposure to sort of the up and coming new drilling areas. So we're talking the Montney, we're talking the Duvernay, the Clearwater, Southeast Saskatchewan, uh, some of the conventional heavier oils. They want exposure there, but they don't wanna pay for the, the, the extreme cost to get into some of these companies, or they don't wanna deal with the inflationary environment that companies in the shaley areas are in. So, you know, people come to me and they say, okay, well, what should I buy then? I want something with a dividend. I want something, you know, stable. And, you know, I say, okay, so maybe the royalty might work for you. Like I personally don't invest in these companies because I am looking for a 110, 120 price environment. And the royalty companies just will not give you that upside torque. And when I invest in oil and gas companies, I'm, I'm going for home runs. Every pitch that's thrown at me, I'm going for home runs. I'm going for grand slams. I'm going for you know doubles, triples, etc. I'm not going for the the bunt base hits. Uh, 
etc. So, uh, you know, nor am I going to not swing at uh, at them if I see something really good. Uh, so, so given that sort of analogy, you know, there, there's a certain kind of investor that that likes these companies. Uh, they want their stable dividends, um, and again, they want exposure without the inflation uh, risk. So. Top has roughly 17,000 uh, BOEs of, of royalty production. Uh, keep in mind, they don't operate any wells. All they do is they have other companies drill on their lands. They get a uh, kind of a cut of it. And then they sort of just take the money and distribute it to shareholders. So pretty simple model. It's run in various other commodity uh, commodity uh producers and and royalty kind of structures um about 23 percent liquids is what they're producing right now topaz's liquids production is going up their liquids percentage is going up so as the liquids percentage goes up we expect that the net backs will go up the the margins per barrel will go up uh, so Definitely want to keep in mind, some of these companies are growing 20%, but they grow 20% all liquids, which means their liquids percentage goes from 23% to like 35%. And their per barrel net back as a company just becomes so much higher. Um, and, and that's not just royalty companies. I'm talking ENPs as well. Companies like Crew Energy, Advantage Energy, their, their liquids percentage is going up at a much faster rate than their company BOE production. Uh, but I'm digressing here. So, uh, you know, about 2,700 barrels of light oil production, some NGLs in there. They got about 144 million shares outstanding, $21 a barrel, uh, a share. They IPO'd at $11 a share, I want to say. So for a royalty company, actually very strong performance uh, in a two years, in a two year time frame, they've, they've doubled the share price while making a lot of acquisitions um, and creating more shares as well, I believe. Uh, pretty low debt, $150 million of debt. That has gone up, I believe, with the recent acquisitions. Uh, but again, everything in the model is as of June 30th, 2022. Uh, pretty decent dividend, 5% yield. Roughly a dividend that continually gets increased uh, as, as kind of time goes on. Um, this, this is what makes royalty companies so attractive. Their adjusted funds flow was, was 94 million. Their free cash flow was 94 million. There is no capital cost at all. It's zero. And you're getting every single dollar of adjusted funds flow is going into free cash flow. Um, they only pay 37 million out of that in dividends last quarter. So, you know, when we look at it, we see, okay, well, there's probably, they could easily double the dividend and more, but they're probably saving money to pay back debt to make some acquisitions, which is fair. Uh, Topaz has basically told you straight up that uh, we are actively going to make acquisitions. They're, they're telling you that they're not hiding anything. Um, and and in, order, in order to make these acquisitions, they have to keep some of that adjusted funds flow for themselves. Um, again, uh, pricing, strip pricing, et cetera. This is all the same. And I, I'll just reiterate this. If you're joining us for the first time, um, I do explain all these boxes in detail in any of the valuation sessions from April, May, June, July, even earlier going into January, February. Uh, but I've just talked about them so many times that now I'm just going to go through them fast and please rely on those earlier uh, sessions for, for a little bit more of the detail. Um, so here we are. At now, using the eight times free cash flow model, at strip pricing, the fair share price is $18.34. So kind of below where we are, just below. Um, at a $100 price environment, the fair share price is $19.02. At a $120 oil price environment, the fair share price is $20.94. So exactly where we're trading. Um, so a couple of things here to mention. One is you can obviously see that royalty companies don't have upside torque at all. 
you're basically getting what it is. It doesn't matter whether oil price is $60 or $120. It, it really does not seem to matter. Um, they just get their, they just get their percentage of the royalty on top and they just keep it. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're sort of getting very low downside supposedly. And the reason I say supposedly is because some of these companies do get hammered when WTI prices dip. Uh, they haven't really gotten beat up so far, uh, with the, with the drop from 120 to 85. Uh, so that's a great sign. Uh, but you also don't get the upside uh, on them. And uh, the, so, so the one thing to mention is the sort of, they don't really have the torque, um, but they also trade at uh, eight times free cash flow already. And this is sort of one of the pushbacks I've gotten on my royalty models is that, you know, if you're saying ENPs should trade at eight times free cash flow, you know, maybe royalty should be trading at 12 times free cash flow or 15 times free cash flow. And you're absolutely correct. I'm, I'm not going to argue that statement. Uh, however, I'm also not going to adjust my model until, until we see that the royalty companies really do trade at higher multiples. There is absolutely no evidence of it so far. And, you know, maybe six months down the road, once ENPs go from trading at three to four times cash, uh, free cash flow to five to six times free cash flow, do the royalty companies really move from eight times to 10 times uh, free cash flow? We'll find out. We, we don't know yet. We have no evidence from any of the royalty companies to prove that. So until then, the model will stay at eight. Um, as soon as one of the royalty companies proves that they can trade at a higher multiple, um, I'm more than happy to adjust my model and, and, and kind of give it that extra valuation. So um, it may be why some of these price targets don't, don't look all that attractive as an investment. Um, but again, they, they come with lower downside risk. They come with the dividend uh, yields already out there with upside dividends possible. and um, a potential re-rate to, to an even higher free cash flow multiple if we get there. A um, little bit of hedging that Topaz has on their oil and their gas. Um, I'm not sure why as a royalty company, they need to hedge their, their, their royalty production, uh, especially with the low debt they have, but um, they're running the company, not me. So I'm kind of just gonna leave it as is. Um, and I put in a little bit of production growth in here just to show kind of the, the growth from what they were projecting. Now keep in mind, Topaz just made the royalty acquisition of uh, Tamarack's acquisition of Delta Stream. Uh, Topaz bought a 5% GORR Gore royalty on it, uh, 268 million, I wanna say. And that does change things, but it just is not incorporated into the model yet until we have good latest information on what the Delta Stream assets are actually producing today and what their growth trajectory is uh, into the future. But do keep an eye out for that. I do, I do and I will adjust this for the acquisitions uh, probably in six weeks or so when the Q3 results for both Tamarack and Topaz are out and I have better visual uh, on sort of what's going on there. Um, so yeah, a little bit of adjustments made for the growth and the hedging, and we sort of end up at the same, same sort of price targets between 18 and $20 um, a share between strip pricing and $120 uh, slash $6 ACO pricing going forward. The capital program is only $4 million, basically nothing. Um, I've added in a little bit of free cash flow for their debt pay down, which is now not going to happen because of the uh, to, uh, Tamarack acquisition. Uh, so, you know, a, a very dynamic company. They, they sort of make one big acquisition every quarter. So we never really have good for, like foresight into what's going on. We almost are, are playing catch up every quarter as we go on. 
which is fine. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, okay. So a couple other things on Topaz, you can see their free cash flow and dividend history. They have a very short history, but they've executed. They've grown their, their cash flow, they've grown their dividend every year, as they said they would. Uh, the revenue keeps growing, the share price keeps growing uh, every year. And we see a 90% free cash flow margin. So um, that's just because they have some, some costs for paying the employees, uh, paying the GNA cost, uh, et cetera. But that sort of fluctuates. The, the FCF margin will get lower when they're giving out their, their, their yearly bonuses and their uh, shares, um, share options and all that. And then it sort of goes into a higher range for the rest of the year. They have roughly 6.1 million royalty acres and 60% of that is undeveloped. So again, as the structural bull cycle continues, people are going to take risks. They are going to drill some wildcat drilling, some step out drilling, some field expansions. And this undeveloped acreage holds a lot of potential to increase royalty volumes. Um, especially if they're wells like Aspen Leaf just drilled. Like if it's producing that much barrels and let's say Topaz has a 5% royalty on it. I mean, that's a, that's a big royalty stream to have a uh, very low decline. Um, they also have committed operator capital. So $1.7 billion of CapEx per year has been committed to sort of 2022 slash 2023 forecast budgeting. And Topaz also has 1.7 billion of tax pool. So for a company that only makes $400 million a year, you're seeing about a three, four, five year, maybe not five, three to four year tax horizon, uh, tax-free horizon. And as an investor today, that's, that's really good uh, because it, it's long enough that the market isn't gonna uh, discount that and tell you, oh, you're gonna move from a tax, a non-taxpayer to taxpayer. Um, you know, four years is just too long of a of a of a time frame for the market to take that into consideration. So, you know, that's great. They got they got a nice long cycle there. Um, so here it is. After the acquisition, they have about 375 million of debt. Uh, they, they only have 700 million of debt capacity. And the reason for that is this company is still pretty much backed by Tourmaline. So if they ever need any money of any sort, um, Tourmaline could come in and give them money or they could raise money on the open market. Uh, given that they already trade at eight times free cash flow, it's not even a bad thing to be diluting um, at this sort of share price, it's it's probably expected to be honest to to raise money at, at these sorts of share prices. So they're they're in sort of an an advantaged position from that standpoint, where they don't need to buy back shares. They they can actually issue shares at these prices, and it it makes a lot of sense as a company uh, to grow and buy more royalty acreage. Um, the way that I look at it, anyways. Um, so this is pretty interesting. 30% of Topaz's first half of 2022 drills are in the clear water. The most prolific, probably highest, not highest, uh, fastest payout North American acreage there is right now. Uh, so, you know, 30% of their drills are going in here. There's some really, really strong wells being hit in the clear water. Um, and a lot of their acreage is in the Mart uh, Martin Hills, Nipissey area, along with Jarvie and Eucalta, where, where Tamarack is, is, is quite active. And uh, Martin Hills and Nipissey obviously being very, very solid, high net back acreage. And if the water flooding in these, ac in these acreages goes well, um, they could produce a lot of royalty volumes over a kind of a three, five, seven year period. Uh, some of the recent Tamarack water flooding schemes are showing almost a 0% decline rate. So uh, not only is the producer benefiting, but Topaz through their royalties 
with Tamarack is, is benefiting a lot. Uh, one thing to notice, they don't have any royalties in the Peavine area, which is the uh, sort of the Baytex uh, core of the core of the core of the, of the Clearwater, uh, some of the best wells out there. So, you know, from a topaz standpoint, it's not really good that they don't have any exposure to that. Uh, from a Baytech standpoint, it's great. They don't want anybody stealing their money. So, um, you know, depending on which way you look at it, it's uh, positive or negative. But either way, Topaz has pretty significant exposure to the rest of the clear water. Uh, they're saying 8.5 billion barrels of original oil in place. And the reason they mention original oil, oil in place is because we don't know the recovery factors that these clear water wells are going to get to. Um, primary drilling, infill drilling, stack drilling, multi-leg drilling, and water flooding. There's not enough wells that have gone through the entire cycle for long enough for us to make any sort of guess. Uh, so basically what they're trying to say is as the water flooding pilots go ahead, as people drill more and more complicated multilateral wells, a lot of this oil could be recovered and Topaz has royalties on all of them in perpetuity. The other thing to notice is Topaz's clear water royalty production is actually going up a lot. And the reason for that is the, the Delta Stream Tamarack acquisition. The, there's a lot of money being put into that acquisition, into those lands uh, in the Martin Hills area, very, very solid wells. And the production growth trajectory that Delta Stream was on um, was, was kind of like from 15,000 barrels a day to 25,000 barrels a day in sort of a six to 12 month time frame. And they're, they're sort of halfway through it. I think they're at about 19 to 20,000 right now. Um, and obviously Topaz has a 5% royalty on those lands. So if you go, if you add 10,000 barrels a day of ENP production, that's 500 barrels a day at that 5% uh, gore uh, on it of, of growth along with the 5% the, um, on the existing production as well. And that's where this blue bar comes in, where they're growing uh, royalty production in the clear water. Um, and here, as it shows, they got exposure to some of the best plays out there. The Martin Hills Nipissey Clearwater, the Montney that Tourmaline has, the Frobisher, the Southeast Saskatchewan Frobisher wells that I've been talking about with Surge, uh, Vermilion, Whitecap, some of the private players. Um, and then the Montney Gundy, obviously, um, being one of the big growth areas. So when we look at what Topaz has in Northeast BC, the Montney, it's all tourmaline acreage. Uh, here's sort of the map of it. And something I want to point out on this map is these wells right here. Um, you know, you kind of see like a, like a weird pattern with them. And these are all Patronus wells that are drilled, completed. Some of them are not tied in. So they're stuck, not stuck, they're held behind pipe in, in anticipation of when LNG Canada is going to start up. So, you know, sort of a cool thing that's happening across the industry is uh, the LNG Canada partners are drilling wells and not bringing them onto production because they're specifically saved for LNG Canada. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of people worried about eco pricing and where things are going. Um, keep these wells in mind. And the reason I say that is because I would guess that there's more than a BCF a day of production sitting behind pipe that's going to go into LNG Canada phase one. And something that doesn't really get talked about very much, like I myself figured that when LNG Canada phase one came online, there would be this massive uh, shift in pricing because we just don't have the, the, the two BCF a day to feed into it. Um, and we would have to drill that to get there. But there are a lot of wells that are sitting behind pipe. Um, and um, one that I want to look into further, 
how much exactly is there? Um, does it still have to be fracked or is it already fracked? Uh, you know, things like this, um, but may not be that important today, but in 12 to 18 months, it could get more and more interesting um, with, with sort of the, the supply demand dynamic of not only ACO, but just Canadian gas in general. So we talk about tourmaline liquids growth. We have Gundy phase two and we got Conroy. Uh, not really near term, it's, a, it's over the next six to 10 years. Um, that being said, look at where Topaz's royalties are, Gundy and Conroy. So not only are they gonna benefit from additional gas coming out of tourmaline, these two are tourmaline's biggest liquids projects. Uh, and like I said before, royal, it, a 5% royalty on a barrel of liquids versus a 5% royalty on a, on a BOE of gas is very, very different. So if you're buying Topaz with a five to seven year outlook, this company could actually grow its cash flows and revenues at a much higher clip than they have been so far because of A, the clear water production which is mostly oil, and B, some of the tourmaline focus moving away from gas into these oily, um, oily plays. So we look at tourmaline, oil production, liquids production, it's gonna triple from 2019 to 2028. Um, and sort of this steady growth profile on it as things go on. So, um, one that the model has a tough time adjusting for because we sort of run off this main liquids percentage number, but I am going to be adjusting for it using this production growth number and the net back on the growth is going to be much higher than their current net back per BOE. So that's the adjustment I'm using to, to show that the liquids percentage is going to get higher as things go along here. Um, so right here from Tourmaline's corporate presentation, uh, strong liquids growth with the advancement of Conroy, uh, 24,000 of, of, of condensate and NGLs. And what makes this even more interesting is that September 6th of this year, so just two weeks ago, Tourmaline put out an update on Conroy and said, yep, we're going ahead with this. We're gonna grow this to 100,000 BOE per day by I think 2028 or 2030. So it's happening. It's already been sanctioned. Basically, they're going to now go ahead with it. And Topaz is going to benefit because they don't have to spend a single dollar. They just sit there watching their royalty volumes go up and counting their dollar bills, um, to put it bluntly, really. Um, so let's talk about the deep basin assets. Again, mostly tourmaline. Uh, they own 2.2 million uh, gross acres here in this area. Not own, they own royalties on 2.2 million uh, gross acres. They also own interest in three tourmaline plants. And you know this is where the money is really being made on these gas plants as well. So the revenue will be 39 million for the year cost roughly 10 million for the year. So very high uh, gross margins. Again, they are liable for some capital and operating expenses here because they own working interest. They don't own overriding royalties. So we got to separate the two things. Um, overriding royalties, you don't pay any expenses at all. Working interest, you do have to pay your fair share of the operating cost and the maintenance cost. Uh, but either way, it's generating roughly $30 million a year and it's in perpetuity. These gas plants are gonna be full forever. Uh, with the way Tourmaline's plans are, they got an 80 year sort of drilling inventory, uh, self-proclaimed 80 year drilling inventory, not reserves, but their own uh, estimates. Um, and you can see why it's a stacked pay. There's about 10 different zones that can all produce 
oil and gas in this entire acreage area. Um, oops, hopefully the Twitter space is still going, yep. Um, so basically, they don't have all 10 zones in the, in the entire acreage, but they have five, seven, eight zones, um, which is just fantastic, which is what makes the deep basin so, so attractive in a $6 plus ACO environment. Um, so that's a deep basin asset. Uh, let's look at a little bit more of the Monty assets. So they have a 12.5% interest in Advantages Glacier gas plant. So on a 15 year, 100% take or pay. So whether Advantage produces the gas or not, doesn't matter. They got to pay for it for 15 years. Excellent. Um, they own 12.5%, which is roughly 50 mm, uh, 50 mm CF per day uh, processing capacity. And because this is a like a gross overriding interest, not a working interest, they get $14 million a year and they pay nothing, not a single cent. They, they don't have to co cover a single cent of operating expenses or maintenance capital. And they get $14 million a year forever. Um, so I wanna make a point here about Advantage Energy, which for those who are invested or, or you wanna invest in pure play gas producers, you're looking at producers in the Montney, like Crew, Advantage, uh, Birchcliff, um, Kelt, etc. This is a brand new plant. It has very little maintenance capital. It has very low operating expenses. One eighth of the plant is generating roughly $14 million of revenue per year. So if we times that by eight, 100% of the plant is generating roughly $110 million of infrastructure revenue slash benefit to advantage. And we know that royalty companies are trading, royalty slash infrastructure companies are already trading at eight times free cash flow. So this plant generates $110 million of free cash flow per year whether it's in revenue or in a direct benefit to advantage, we times that by eight, so an eight multiple, roughly $900 million. This gas plant is worth $900 million as long as it's full, which it is. Go look at Advantage Energy's enterprise value who own 88% of this gas plant and produce 60,000 BOEs per day, and then subtract the, the fact that they own this gas plant from their EV, and you will get a number for, for the value of, of Advantage's production that makes no sense at all. Like that company is trading so cheap. Um, I personally don't invest in dry gas producers. Um, I know Advantage is, is, is producing more liquids, more condensates, et cetera. But for a dry gas producer, if you're comparing a company like Birchcliff to Advantage, it's not even close in terms of which company, in my opinion, again, this is not investment advice, in my opinion, which is set up to be sort of a better company going forward, um, both from a acreage perspective and sort of these intangibles perspective. And the reason I mentioned this is not to pick a company or diss a company, it's that Barely anybody is looking into these companies going this deep into the analysis. So they just look at, oh, this thing's flowing at this many dollars per BOE per day. This thing has this much dividend. So this company is better. Fair enough. But if you want to look at a 12 to 24 to 36 month investment thesis, there are companies that are going to perform way better that on paper don't look that way right now but when we dive deeper into it, may make a lot more sense. Uh, so I'm just gonna leave you with that, uh, whoever's attending uh, this presentation. Um, I see the same issue occurring, not only between these two companies, 
but between other companies in other sectors that are like direct competitors for investor capital. There are companies that look way better on paper. And then there are companies that are over the next 12 to 24 months are going to show you that they're intangible slash land slash infrastructure slash management slash, you know, drilling inventory value come into fruition and they just completely blow away their competition um, in terms of what they're worth. Um, so I'll leave it at that. The other thing with this glacier plant, and again, or, or Topaz has a 12.5% interest in all the revenue that comes out of this. Um, glacier has that entropy advantage entropy system installed on it. Uh, this system cost $88 million for its three phases, and it generates roughly $7 million a year of revenue forever. Um, so you might think, what a waste of money. Like, man, you could have drilled wells and made more, more money than this. Like this complete a waste of money. But this $6.9 million of annual operating income is at a $50 per ton carbon price, which is what it is today. But the actual carbon price is going to, if the Canadian government goes ahead with it, which I think they will, goes up to $170 a ton by 2030. And, you know, seven years away. The break even carbon price of this project was $49 a ton. So today they're only making a dollar per ton of profit of, of net operating income. But as that carbon pricing goes higher and higher, you have this inbuilt torque to the benefits from selling these carbon credits. And I'm not exactly sure who's making the money on these carbon credits, but I think if Topaz has a 12.5% interest in the plant, they would have a 12.5% interest in the entropy uh, add-on to this. And maybe I'm wrong on that. So this, this definitely has to be checked and done some due diligence on it. Um, but the point being, Topaz might have an interest in this carbon credit um, money-making machine over the next five, seven, 10 years, um, and possibly why they did this deal to begin with. Um, and also with the budget of 2022, there are producers like Whitecap that didn't get a lot of bonus from being a net, uh, a net zero company. But if you look at new equipment, the Canadian government is actually giving a lot of money for, for carbon capture storage equipment and transportation equipment. So um, again, this is completely digressing from, from Topaz, but Topaz seems to be looking out for, for going into infrastructure that has this CO2 capture potential on it. And they could benefit from the capital upfront. They could get deals on it from the government subsidies, and then they get the carbon credits going forward. Um, and trust me, Tourmaline is not stupid. They, they will be looking at this and seeing how they can maximize value. And Topaz gets that 5% bonus um, on it through, uh, through Tourmaline. Um, here's the carbon kind of pricing regimes in the EU, the US, and Canada, where they're going. Uh, something that's sort of interesting just in general. Uh, it doesn't matter what you believe in. It really doesn't. As an investor, all we care about is what's happening, not whether it's real or fake or or it's a scam. It 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 doesn't matter. The point is, people are paying you to sequester carbon. As an investor, if I can make money off that, I will. Um, and the other thing, again, what I like about Topaz is when they do these royalty deals, you can sort of run valuations on what assets are worth without the asset actually being sold, uh, which is kind of a cool thing. Like, you know, if somebody asks you, what is this asset worth? You would have to wait for a sale of the asset to sort of get a real market value. Um, but with these royalties, you can figure out, okay, if 5% of the asset is worth this, 
then 100% is worth Y. Uh, so Weyburn, Whitecap owns roughly 60% of Weyburn, uh, roughly. They made a deal with Topaz that Topaz would buy a 5% operating royalty on it. No, overriding royalty for $188 million. Okay. This deal was done in, in October, 2021 when oil prices were roughly $65, $70 a barrel. No, a little bit higher than that, $75 a barrel, roughly. Um, today, prices are $85 a barrel and likely headed higher if you believe the macro outlook. So the way that I've been thinking about this, if Topaz bought a gross overriding royalty for this, this dollar per percentage of Weyburn, in a $75 price environment, that's probably worth the same as a working interest purchase in a $100 oil price environment. So let me explain that a little bit. When we go from $75 to $100 price environment, the working interest is obviously worth more. So we need to adjust for it. So it's not just worth 188 million, it might be worth 250, 275 because the price of oil actually has gone up. But then we got to adjust that back because we're trying to get a value for the operating asset, not for a royalty uh, part of the asset. When Topaz owns its royalty, they don't pay operating costs, they don't pay royalties, they don't pay uh, the operators, they don't pay for maintenance, nothing. So we need to adjust it back to a company like Whitecap, which is actually paying those fees. So we adjusted from 188 to 275 because the prices have gone up. Now we adjust back to maybe 175. So we knock off 100 million because the owner actually has to operate the asset. They don't just get a royalty on it. So 5% of Weyburn is worth 175 million. We adjusted 188 up to 275 and then back to 175 to account for the non-royalty. 5% of Weyburn is worth $175 million. Whitecap owns roughly 60% of Weyburn. Therefore, Weyburn itself is worth over $2 billion as is. Now take Whitecap's enterprise value, take $2 billion off of it, and tell me, is the rest of Whitecap worth only $4 billion? And then compare that to its peers in the, in the same production slash market cap range. And I can tell you one company is going to do a lot better going forward when we actually take into account these intangible values for CO2 and carbon credits and untapped acreage, blah, blah, blah. Um, so again, I'll leave that at that. There's also a junior company in my portfolio, ROK Resources, that owns roughly 2% of Weber, run the same valuation, 5% for 175 million, run it to a 2% of Weyburn value and tell me that ROK resources, what the value of ROK resources is once we take the Weyburn part out of the EV. Um, and is the rest of the company worth what's left? Um, and you can see why I'm investing in some of these companies going forward. Um, this is just something more about Weyburn. Uh, the growth, uh, I think I'll end the Topaz thing on this. It's just, it's a growing company. They've increased production, they've increased cash flow, they've increased revenue. People are drilling more wells on their lands and people are drilling Clearwater, Frobisher, Montney wells. Um, high impact wells, very fast payout, huge production. Um, that's where the money is for the ENPs to be made. So why would they not continue drilling in those areas? Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a royalty growth company and they're increasing the dividend as well to, to go with that. Um, Tourmaline still has a pretty strong shareholder uh, exposure in Topaz. So naturally they will want their Tourmaline assets to do well. So the Topaz assets do well. Um, yeah, and this is this, the production as is right now, 
has gone from about 16,000 be uh, 166 to about almost 20,000 BOEs by the end of next year from just organic drilling growth. It they don't need to make any acquisitions. It's just organic drilling growth is going to get them to roughly just over 19,000, like 19.2, 19.3. Um, so about a 15% growth from where we are today, just from organic drilling, um, which increases cash flow, it increases revenues, it increases dividend payments, it increases free cash flow uh, without any maintenance spend, any capital spend, any operating cost spend, and any deals that need to be made. And that therein is the attractiveness that some people have to royalty companies in a high inflation environment. Um, okay, is there any questions on Topaz? Uh, Prairie Sky is pretty short, so I'm just gonna run through that fast. Um, but anything on that that didn't make sense? I know I went through a little bit of math here with the, the Weyburn thing, the, uh, the Glacier Advantage thing. Um, and, and we have to run these sorts of math with royalty companies to see where they're going. Um, Cause it's not really clear until you look at the growth of their acreage uh, that they own. Okay, right on. So I don't see anything. Um, I will just say one last time that anyone on the Twitter spaces that wants to join for the visuals, the Zoom link is at whitetundra.ca. Scroll to the bottom under events. The Zoom link is right there, and we can, um, or you can join in for the for the actual visuals, Excel sheets. Um, if not, feel free to keep listening in on the uh, Twitter Spaces. Um, okay, so Joe made a comment that Imperial Oil has rail loading as well. If the pipeline apportionment goes higher, great point. Uh, I think I've made a pretty bullish case for Imperial, so I'll uh, just leave. Leave that as is. Uh, definitely a good good benefit to have uh, the the rail loading terminals. Uh, Saber says I'm talking about I3 without saying I3. Uh, yeah, potentially yes. Yeah, I mean, the the companies that are in my portfolio are there. Not just because they're good good uh, investment candidates, it's because I think they're going to beat their peers in in the peers that they compete with for direct investment. Um, direct investment. So, uh, you know, we, we want to be at the best, have the best companies that are going to show their value as times go on. I'm not, I'm not trading companies. I'm not day trading stuff. I'm not buying them and selling them in a month. No, my portfolio has been pretty relatively stable for the last year almost. Uh, so, you know, I, I need, I need to give these companies time to prove their value out uh, and kind of showcase the hidden potential. I3 has a number of royalties. So I3 doesn't own any royalties. They actually pay royalties. Uh, and I believe they pay some to Topaz too, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Topaz and Prairie Sky, I think both have that um, royalties that I3 pays into. Uh, okay, so Prairie Sky, um, Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't know that. That they. You're right. You're right. I three does own royalties because when they when they uh, put out their Q two releases and whatnot, they have about seven hundred BOEs of of royalty production that they also own. So, good catch, uh, KK. There. That's uh, yeah. That's a that's a great point. They they do own it. I I'm not sure how much expansion potential there is on it. Uh, whether the companies are drilling uh, on their lands and growing, but uh, hey, nice little bonus there that that I three has, and uh, um, the North Sea Serenity drill I think spotted as of two or three days ago. So lots of good things going on with I three uh, for sure. Uh, but yeah, thanks for that. Uh, appreciate that uh, correction. Uh, so Prairie Sky, very similar to Topaz, a little bit bigger, twenty six thousand uh, BOEs per day. Uh, way more liquids, 58% liquids instead of 23% liquids, uh, worth roughly $5 billion EV as of right now. Again, most of the adjusted funds flow is going into free cash flow. 160 million adjusted funds flow, 158 free cash flow. That's what the royalty holders love. 
and they uh, dream about their uh, dividends as they go to sleep. They don't care what inflation is. It doesn't matter to them. They don't care what operating cost is. Uh, doesn't matter to them. So where do we end up at? Uh, we're at about $18.76 a share right now. Uh, strip pricing, $14.13 a share, fair, uh, fair share price. Again, on the eight times FCF model. When we look at $100 uh, WTI, $17.50 a share. $120 WTI, we get $21.84 a share. So Topaz definitely trades at a bit of a premium compared to a company like Prairie Sky when we look strictly at cash flow and the FCF times eight model. Um, and you know that's just that's just the nature of the beast with Topaz having very strong shareholders, uh, Tourmaline's involvement obviously and growing as well. People love growth, a growth investments. It just seems to be what they like. Uh, so maybe that's that's a reason for it too. No hedging, no production growth here. Uh, Prey Sky made a huge acquisition, uh, probably six months or a year ago of, of heritage royalties. Uh, so they've sort of fully got that into the production numbers. So nothing here going on. And we end up with sort of the same numbers for our uh, fair share price model. Uh, strip pricing, $14.13 a share, $100, $5.50 gas, $16.89, and $120 WTI, $6 ACO is $21.64. So not too, too much upside if we don't get a re-rating on the multiples. So, you know, the royalty companies are more so a downside protection risk and a multiple re-rating potential on the upside. A $0 capital program, they're not spending anything. As a pay down debt, they get a bit of free cash flow, extra sources. Um, and we'll get straight to the kind of the insight part of this. So, uh, what's going on here? So, Prairie Sky, if you want to learn about royalties, if you want to learn about what are the different acreages in Canada, this is the uh, Bible of royalties and Canadian production. I don't think the 2022 version is out yet, but basically this will tell you, and it's it's on Prey Sky's website. It tells you, it starts out with a kind of a history of Prey Sky, a business model of Prey Sky, which is all fine, whatever. But then they have an overview of royalties. How do royalties work? What are gore royalties? What are fee lands? What are working interest royalties? What are these GRT lands, uh, lessor interests, crown interest lands? It tells you everything you need to know about how they figure all this stuff out. Um, it tells you a little bit about a little bit about Prairie Sky, which is fine. Like we already know all this, but it, then it tells you the history of fee lands, and there's a land overview. There's all these systems that they talk about. Uh, what is seismic data, uh, kind of where their land holdings are. They talk about this checkerboard pattern and why it came to be. Uh, so a little bit about the history of Canadian oil, uh, production allocations, and then they talk about asset summaries. So they discuss uh, their assets and sort of what are they producing? What's the upside on them? What's the history on them? They, they have every single asset here the reserves on them, the undiscounted value on them, the future fee lands on them, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's just a whole great information on here. So for example, let's look at the Viking. They talk about the reservoir characteristics in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, they show you maps, they show you actual pictures of how monobore drilling works. Uh, they have some logs, actual logs, like well logs from these areas that show you the oil zone. Um, they show you, you know, acreage maps. They show you the recent, recent drilling uh, data, future opportunities in each of these pools. Um, again, they show you what a multilateral drilling looks like, what the example well logs are. And I read this a while back, 
Um, but I think this is one that I, it's worth reading. If you're interested in ENPs, if you're interested in royalties in different uh, areas of the uh, Canadian oil patch, which I assume you will be if you're listening to me talk about well logs and different uh, uh, Petro Ninja maps and all this, this is just amazing. And I, I would say that it's worth reading. It shows you the early stage growth areas. Um, and why would Prairie Sky know this? Because they own the lands. They, would, they know exactly what their ENPs are producing from these lands, which are the growth areas where has somebody drilled a well that nobody knows about, but it's on Prairie Sky lands and therefore Prairie Sky knows about it. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. It's about 140 pages of uh, basically data nerd stuff and just great stuff to know. Uh, porosities, permeabilities, pressures, resources in place. Um, you know, you want to attend the next comm meetup and you want to show off your knowledge about the Duvernay and well logging, you know, this is, this is it. This is uh, gospel. Uh, so I just want to start off with that and leave that with you. Um, I'm happy to discuss any of these things. I love talking about certain plays and um, kind of where things are going. So uh, if somebody else has read this and you want to discuss something, I'm happy to. Um, Compared to Topaz, which had 6 million acres, uh, Prairie Sky is 18 and a half million acres of royalty land. So quite a bit bigger, more liquids. Uh, they closed a billion dollars of acquisitions in 2021. Um, and, and kind of the interesting thing is they haven't made any acquisition after December, 2021. So they made all their acquisitions when things were cheap. And then they just said, ah, we're done. We're gonna just leave these be and uh, continue on. In uh, pretty stark contrast to some other companies um, which are making acquisitions and overpaying, I think, in the last six months for royalty acreage. Um, that's just my opinion. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at all the royalty deals that were made uh, since sort of 2020, even earlier, since 2018, 2017. And there are companies that are overpaid for them because they had to get into a bidding war with companies like a Prairie Sky, which have better contacts, they have a better history, they just have better acreage, better lands, they have more of a stranglehold on the on the royalty uh, regime within within Canada, anyways. Um, so they, in about eight years, they've gone from five million acres to eighteen point five million acres. You see, they've really expanded out of their core zones into the other parts of the Canadian production, uh, which is what you like to see. You like to see them have exposure to a variety of plays that are economic at different gas pricing, different oil pricing, uh, NGLs, condensates, et cetera. Um, acres per million shares has almost doubled. So when we look at how many acres they have for a unit of shares outstanding, they have a lot more acreage now. And you might say, what does it mean? It doesn't really mean anything. Well, so far, but in a structural bullish cycle, again, people will go and drill in areas that have not been drilled in before and owning a lot of royalties on major acreages everywhere doesn't really show its true colors until there's a structural bullish five, seven, 10 year cycle. Um, so I'm definitely watching again how this company does versus its peers um, who don't have as much acreage. They have more like active drilling areas versus Prairie Sky, which has a lot of undeveloped, same like Topaz, undeveloped areas. 50% of revenue and capital on Prairie Sky land is from private operators. So quite a bit different than, than a Topaz which is mostly with public operators. Uh, Prairie Sky is dealing with private companies. Good or bad, it's, it's really hard to say. One can argue that the private companies are more likely to expand production over the next two, three, five years. Um, is that actually gonna happen that way? I, I'm not gonna say one way or the other, but 
mostly it's the private companies that end up doing a lot of this growth expansion, uh, especially with the way shareholders of public companies are right now and wanting a cash return policies uh, back. Um, Prey Sky also has the largest Clearwater royalty acreage. So Topaz has a lot with Tamarack specifically, but Prairie Sky has 1.3 million acres across the entire Clearwater. So as operators go and they delineate the Clearwater, they will one way or another end up on uh, Prairie Sky land. Where has been the biggest growth in conventional production? The Clearwater right here. We see it went from zero to about 80,000 barrels a day in five years. The rest of the conventional plays are declining. We see our Bakken, we see our uh, Viking, our Cardiums. Um, the Charlie Lake might actually grow higher. And Charlie Lake is not really conventional, I would say, but uh, okay. But the Clearwater by far has the biggest growth trajectory. And you want to be the biggest Clearwater royalty acreage company. Uh, it's, it's just simple science. Now, they don't have as much in the Martin Hills, Nipissee area, uh, which is the better wells. Uh, that being said, uh, having more acreage is likely better because Martin Hills and Nipissee are basically drilled out other than the water flooding that can happen. Uh, there's not that much in like new massive acreage left. So you're not gonna see this growth from zero barrels to 20,000 or, or whatever from a producer in the Martin Hills, Nipissee area. Uh, I mean, Spur is just dominating anyways and they're gonna grow anyways. Uh, but you, know, you, you can't really lose being in the clear water, I guess is what I should say. And Prairie Sky got into the clear water in 2017. Uh, so I just mentioned a few minutes earlier that they know where the growth is going to be. They, because they have so much acreage, they know when somebody has drilled a decent well somewhere and there's no activity in the area. So Prairie Sky bought their Clearwater royalty lands in 2017 before the Clearwater was even a thing. And now the Clearwater is the largest conventional play in Canada. So when we say that data is worth a lot of money, it is especially so in royalty companies. They have access to every single operator, public and private. And then as soon as they see something good being drilled, they go and buy a bunch of royalty land next to it uh, for cheap before the other people know about it. 99% operating margins, again, all your adjusted funds flow is going to free cash flow unhedged royalty portfolio. Here we see that a illustrative operator is paying royalties, they're paying operating costs, and they're paying F&D uh, finding and development cost. So their operating margin ends up like 50% or some of the actual revenue per barrel. With a royalty company, you get 99% of the revenue. The board and management of Prairie Sky have invested $80 million into Prairie Sky shares. Very strong um, cohesion between shareholders and management. All staff are shareholders and they've maximized their participation in the stock purchase plans. Now, most of these employees probably get to buy these shares at a discount. So why would they not maximize it? But let's let's, agree with them for now that it still means something that in such a volatile industry with all their income already tied to the company, they still go ahead and they maximize the, the stock purchase plans uh, because they usually, they can't sell the shares for a year, I think is what it is. There's some sort of limits on it. Um, so very good to see. A um, few other things here. So this is, I spoke about on my model, I adjust for the seasonality of CapEx and the seasonality of production coming online. You can see that there in this chart. Every Q2, 
and Q4, the wells drilled goes down, the wells rig released goes down, and the wells on production goes down. So somebody is looking at this chart and they might say, oh no, we're having a slowdown in the Canadian oil patch. The, the Q2 wells drilled are half of what Q1 was. It's not the case. It, it's just a seasonal slowdown with spring breakup, uh, with a lot of maintenance going on, it happens every year, nothing really to it. Uh, but as an investor in Canadian ENPs, I bet a lot of people still don't know this. They look at Q2 numbers and they say, wow, the free cash flow was amazing uh, in Q2. Well, yeah, because they spent very little CapEx in Q2. Uh, so definitely something to keep in mind. A very diversified revenue stream. So the top 25 companies that are on Prairie Sky Lands provide them about 70%, I think, 65 or 70% of their income. Uh, so very diversified. And when we look at the top 25 pairs, um, and, and maybe you're thinking, oh, 50% of their operators are private, 50% of their revenue and capital is on private companies. Uh, aren't private companies more risky? They might go bankrupt, um, possibly. But let's look at the private companies in their top 25. We've got Artist Exploration, which is a big East Duvernay player, safe. We've got Aspen Leaf Energy, backed by Arc Financial, safe. We got Bonavista Energy, a 60,000 BOE per day gas producer, plus a little bit of oil, very, very safe. Um, Ember Resources, a, a large sort of old, old, low production conventional producer, very good. A Carve Energy is a Viking player. We got Pacific Cambrium, which is an LNG Canada participant. Uh, we have Ridgeback, um, which is on sale, by the way. Uh, we got Spur Petroleum. Hint, hint. Guess which company's acreage you want to be in in the Clearwater. Basically, the top, the top producer in the Clearwater, the best producer in the Clearwater, uh, Spur. Um, for anyone that has access to Spurs Q2 report, um, you should go in and, and read what they say. Spurs says, we are making so much damn money off this clear water that we can pay dividends, we can pay special dividends, we can buy back shares, we can increase production substantially, and we can pay back debt. And we still have way too much money that we have no idea what to do with it. The clear water, our clear water, clear water is just so good. Um, you know, Prairie Sky has the royalties on it. Um, Strathcona Resources, backed by Waters Fund, 180,000-ish BOE per day producer now, 160,000. Uh, you know, really, really solid company. They have expansion plans, uh, Tyne Energy, which just bought the uh, Repsol Chauvin asset. So what I'm trying to get at is these are all growth companies. These private producers want to grow and 50% of uh, Prairie Sky's revenue comes from growth companies, private growth companies, uh, Westlake Energy, uh, a, a multilateral king, uh, if you will. So really, really solid companies. Um, in there. Seismic data, um, basically worthless. For the last five to six years, seismic data has been basically worthless. It has meant nothing. And I make the same point as the structural bull market continues, as companies want to go and drill step out wells, wildcat wells, um, delineation wells, they have to come and buy seismic data. And Prairie Sky owns 20,000 square kilometers of 3D seismic, over 4.9 million acres. And they got 54,000 kilometers of 2D seismic. Uh, they own it. They own this data so they can sell it multiple times. They can sell access to one operator, then the second operator, then the third operator, take the same money from each operator, and they still own the seismic data. Uh, sounds like a money printing. Uh, machine, you could almost say they're uh, price gouging possibly. Maybe we need windfall taxes on uh, 3D seismic data uh, coming up. 
so this is just a little bit of history on Prairie Sky. They came out of, I mean, it goes all the way back to 1676 when England came into Canada. They gave acreage to the to the royal uh, no to the railroads in this checkerboard pattern, uh, and that's basically what Prairie Sky still has. It went to uh, Canadian Pacific Oil and Gas. It went to Pan Canadian, and then it went to uh, what when Pan Canadian and AEC merged, it became in Canada. In Canada being Energy Canada, which is why so many people are so mad that they changed their name. Um, it literally was Energy Canada. Um, I won't get into that. And um, and then in 2014, Prairie Sky got spun out of Incana as sort of a royalty company. Uh, they bought some, they made some massive deals in 2014, and then they acquired CNRL's royalty acreage. And then 2021, they just bought Heritage Royalty, which is about a 3 million acre package, uh, roughly a billion dollars. And uh, that's where they are today. So um, that's, uh, that's that on Prairie Sky Royalty. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that's all, all sort of how I had. So I was kind of looking forward to share a little bit more on royalties. Um, they're not the way for me to play this cycle but they are a more defensive uh, way that, you know, you still get the upside, you still get the multiple expansion possibilities. Uh, you get your dividends as things go. And, um, you know, if you can get a five to 7% dividend and the share price goes up another 10% every year, maybe that's what people are looking for from this, from this structural bullish cycle with uh, possible downside protection. And, um, it caters to a different sort of investor for sure. Um, it's not often that I see both royalties and ENPs in a in a aggressive portfolio. I think most most aggressive portfolios betting on a structural bullish outlook on oil have strictly ENPs and possibly service companies. Um, but hey, there's a company for everyone. There's a portfolio construction method for everyone. Uh, so I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, if there's any questions on the Zoom, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, if not, I think we'll just kind of end it here. I have a session on junior companies coming up next week. Uh, it was postponed from August 28th, I believe, maybe. It was postponed uh, August 21st, I think. Um, but there, there'll be two private operators I'll talk about. Um, B32 Exploration, a DuVernay player. E uh, not East Duvernay, but it's like a step out Duvernay and then Astara Energy, which is a Viking blowdown scenario operator. And um, along with that, I got a couple um, public companies, 10th Half Petroleum, which is in my portfolio, and then uh, Cobra Venture, which is a really strange company, but just highlighting different things out there. Um, that, that could potentially be of interest to investors in the sector, people who have been following my videos. Um, you know, you, you're now experts on, on other companies uh, through your own due diligence. You have them in your portfolios. Uh, maybe you're looking for something to kind of spice it up. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I got a couple other sessions coming up on some uh, clear water companies. And uh, I believe Headwater is coming up and some other ones. And then October 16th will be our Q3 preview special, which will be, I'll talk about each company, their Q2 results, who they are, where they produce, what they do, what are their growth plays, management, et cetera. A two to three minute clip on each company. We'll start with the A's, we'll end with the Z's. So we'll, we'll cover roughly 56 or 57 companies should be a fun little session, you know, two and a half, three hours of uh, kind of a who is and what they are of the Canadian oil patch. And, um, you know, I hope to kind of make that my featured video that anyone who's new to the sector can just understand 60 companies in a three hour session and then pick the ones they like, then go to the free cash flow uh, price target spreadsheets and say, okay, these ones are the ones making money. And it gives them a head up on due diligence. They don't have to go in and um, 
you know, they, they pick a company that has really good free cash flow, but then they don't like something about it later on or whatever. Um, and again, this is just my vision. It, it may not actually happen this way, uh, but it was an idea that was given to me and uh, I, I really liked it. So um, yes, yeah, so we'll go with that. Uh, yeah, thanks for attending uh, for sure. Um, Albert says uh, US investors need to do DD on these Canadian royalty names and tax consequences. Uh, they're not the same as owning C Corps. Uh, yeah, I don't know about any of that, but uh, yeah, for sure there, there, there is tax consequences and potentially something to be discussed with your accountant before you know just trading them as, as, as strict ENPs for sure. Um, yeah, thanks Mohammed for, for attending, appreciate. Uh, your support for sure. Um, and what else was I going to say? Uh, yeah, so so this will be recorded, uh, or this is recorded. It'll be posted on the YouTube here shortly, uh, along with the website. And again, like I said, for anyone that wasn't here at the start, I'm working on some very, very cool data visualization uh, dashboards, uh, along with MC Mike there. And uh, hope hope to have that out in the next kind of four to six weeks. Uh, it'll have basically everything. And one of the cool things that it's going to have is uh, kind of like clips. It's going to have 30 to 45 second clips that go through the assets of the company. So for example, seven gens that ARC now owns, it'll have seven gens acreage, and then it'll go through kind of like a seven year cycle in a, in a 15 second clip of how they've been drilling it out. And on the side will be the production growth, uh, the capital put in, uh, cumulative capital put in, and you know, just, just to kind of show how, how these assets are being developed. And then each company will have that for each of their assets uh, and we'll have sort of a company-wide uh, clip. And uh, MC Mike mentioned that to me and I just fell in love with the idea. I said, wow, that's, uh, you know, that's really, really cool. So I am really excited to kind of launch that um, soon, soon. I know I've been saying that for a while, but I'm finally, Kind of fully set up in San Diego and 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 settle down. So um, have a lot more time now to be productive, if you will. Uh, so there's a question here: Why don't you hold I3 in your personal portfolio? Um, there's no real reason uh, for it. It's it just my personal portfolio is set up to make a lot of money. I I'm not only trying to hit home runs. I'm trying to hit grand slams in my personal portfolio. Uh, my personal portfolio on the website also includes whatever's in my TFSA. So as you know, the way the TFSA works, you know, uh, a company like I3 does fit, obviously, uh, but Vermilion options just are even better from an upside perspective. Um, and I already hold enough I3. I bought I3 at 18 and a half cents when I added it to my White Tundra portfolio. So I get roughly a 11 to 12% dividend yield on it. Uh, yield yield to purchase, um, and the North Sea drill just started, so I'm really looking forward to that. I I don't think the success rate is that high in that area, but the upside, if the success rate does hit, is um, is quite high. It could be 30, 40, 50 cents a share, just that North Sea asset uh, going forward. So, and that's just one drill. If they do prove oil, I mean, they could drill more wells uh, and, and kind of grow it out. So, um, and thank you to Gary for that information. I, I appreciate you looking into that uh, if you're on this chat. Um, you know, it's, it's always nice to have connections with, with people who actually know what's going on in that area because I3 is a very opaque company. They, it's, it's very hard to know what's going on in the North Sea area, you know, what's, what's happening what the success rate of this well is. A lot of the North Sea drilling knowledge has been lost uh, over the years with the way the asset has declined. So I do appreciate people reaching out with you know good information on, uh, on all that. Um, and before I end it, I just wanna say for anyone that's following me on the Westcan energy story, uh, they did spot the well on Tuesday. There was a news release that came out on that. And uh, based on kind of the news release, I think they're on to the probably the second or third leg as we speak. And it's gonna be 10 leg well, nine or 10 leg well. 
and uh, should have some results at the end of the month here, uh, early initial stages. Um, I've been in contact with Greg, the CEO, and said, look, you need to get, you know, you need to get a lot of news releases out. There's a, there's people watching this and people who are invested in this. And, you know, we want, we want news releases every week or every 10 days to know what's going on with this well. I mean, this well is the company. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people have had to have a lot of patience with this company, myself included. I've been very frustrated at times, uh, but we're here and we're drilling. And um, the reason I point that out is because I think there's more opportunities like this. You know, the, the markets have been very shut so far. Nobody wants to invest in private equity. Nobody wants to invest in junior plays. Nobody wants to invest in new drills. Uh, but this is sort of a big test here. Uh, you know, if, if, if this one can be a strong drill, that sort of gives us the indication that there are other junior companies out there or drills out there that just got abandoned because management just couldn't hang on from 2014 to 2020. It, it was just too much. And um, potentially we'll see more of these plays as kind of things go on. Uh, but nothing yet, nothing has been here yet, but uh, it makes me excited for the industry. When I, when I started my petroleum engineering in 2013, you know, oil prices were north of hundred dollars a barrel. Uh, things were going really well. And then I just saw the entire industry just deflate, like even the most bullish, most passionate investors and management teams and uh, engineers and students, you could just see them, you know, they, they kind of every year, every month that went by, it was just like, oh man, like this industry, we're here for lower, for longer pricing environment. And now I see it going the other way where every month is like, yeah, we're paying down debt. We're buying back stocks. We're doing a little bit of hiring. We're doing some exploration. We're doing some M&A activity. You know, we're, we're seeing the cycle sort of come into itself. And, and, you know, for, um, from a petroleum engineering standpoint, there's nothing more, more that I'm passionate about than, than wildcat drilling and going out and, you know, going out in the middle of the bush and drilling, uh, a well somewhere that nobody dared to drill and you produce a boomer, uh, you know, boomer well. And, uh, um, it, it just, it just is what oil, the oil industry is, uh, when we look at its history it's all been people, you know, covered in oil on site in these deserts and, and jungles and uh, all looking for oil to, uh, you know, to feed the world's growing thirst for energy uh, as the white tundra uh, slogan, I guess, is. So um, again, thanks everybody for joining us today. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session. The YouTube will be on here shortly and I see no more questions. So I'll leave it there. And um, I uh, hope everyone has a great rest of your weekend and we'll see you uh, next Sunday here. Uh, cheers.